Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, today I am here to talk about dysregulation of lipid metabolism in diabetes mellitus. So we are going to see about dysregulation of lipid metabolism under the following headings. We will just discuss initially the overview of diabetes mellitus, metabolic effect of insulin and glucagon on lipid metabolism, lipid metabolism in well fed state that means when insulin is there and lipid metabolism when insulin is not there in diabetes mellitus or it is partly there. Or but it has no effect, like that means I am talking about insulin resistance and that is type 2 diabetes mellitus. We will see the summary of it and the take home message. So in this particular picture, which is the recent report of WHO, you can see that 422 million worldwide are affected with diabetes and it has so much loss, it, it's causing so much loss, 3.7 million that has occurred due to diabetes. It has microvascular as well as macrovascular complications. You can see that every one person in 11 person are affected, is affected due to diabetes. And when we talk about microvascular complication, it has diabetic nephropathy, diabetic retinopathy and diabetic neuropathy we are talking about. And when we talk about macrovascular complication due to diabetes, we talk about heart attack, we talk about the effect it has on brain when it is blocked, that is stroke we are talking about. So when we see this figures, which is uh, this figure which WHO has recently uh, reported and you can see in India that how 2000 there was and figure in 2030 it is going to be double. So, so many people are affected with diabetes and the complication associated with it, atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease is causing a lethal damage to all people. So let us see that how this coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis is caused due to dysregulation of lipid metabolism in absence of insulin or when the insulin is not affected. So first we will see what diabetes mellitus is. So it is a multifactorial polygenic syndrome characterized by elevated fasting blood glucose level. So when we say elevated fasting blood glucose level, we should know what is a normal fasting blood glucose level. So when we say less than 100 milligrams, less than 100 milligrams per deciliter according to American Diabetes Association, they say less than 100 milligrams per deciliter is if fasting blood glucose is less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, it is normal. But if it exceeds 100 milligrams per deciliter and it is between 101 to 125, it is called as impaired glucose tolerance. And when it exceeds more than and when it exceeds more than 126 milligrams per deciliter it is called as diabetes. So if fasting blood glucose level is more than 126 milligrams per deciliter with the characteristic features of diabetes, then it is called as diabetes. So when we see this definition again, it is a multifactorial. There are many things involved in the cause of this diabetes. Many genes are involved, that's why it is, call, that's why it is called as polygenic syndrome and characterized by elevated fasting blood glucose caused by relative or absolute deficiency of insulin. Why do we say relative? Relative means compared to the previous one. If the insulin secretion is reduced, absolute, when we are talking about there is no insulin at all, we are talking about the type 1 diabetes. So based on this definition, there are two types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, which was formerly called as insulin dependent diabetes. The onset of this type of diabetes is early onset and that's why it is also called as juvenile diabetes. And the cause associated with this diabetes is the destruction of beta cells of pancreas. It is autoimmune destruction of beta cells of pancreas. The type 2 diabetes, which is formerly called as non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, but now it is not called as non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus because at the later stage of type 2 diabetes, you would need insulin. That's why this definition of uh, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus is not uh, absolute, it is not uh, applicable for today. What is the cause of type 2 diabetes? First important cause is insulin resistance and second is 
later stage it causes beta cell failure function of beta cell uh, will be disrupted why the, and there there are many risk factors associated with this like increased weight is one of the risk factor associated with type 2 diabetes so it is a lifestyle disorder basically so let us see further that what is the different regulation uh, insulin actually is uh, important for so in this particular slide we will see that metabolic effect of insulin on lipid metabolism insulin has very important role in all the metabolism when we talk about carbohydrate metabolism lipid metabolism or protein metabolism but today's talk we will focus on lipid metabolism only so insulin is a polypeptide hormone which is released from uh, pancreas beta cells of pancreas uh, it has 51 amino acid and it has a and b chain and it is released in response to a high glucose diet or high carbohydrate rich diet and what does it has an effect on lipid metabolism first lipoprotein lipase lipoprotein lipase is an enzyme which is present in the capillaries of uh, blood capillaries of adipose tissue and skeletal muscles so in response to insulin this lipoprotein lipase get induced the secretion of lipoprotein lipase increases this lipoprotein lipase it acts on the triacyl rich uh, chylomicron when this triacyl uh, rich triacyl glycerol rich tri uh, chylomicron comes to the adipose tissue blood capillaries lipoprotein lipase act on this triacyl glycerol and breaks down this triacyl glycerol in fatty acid and glycerol this fatty acid will be taken up by the adipose tissue which will be later utilized to form triacyl glycerol in adipose tissue the glycerol from this breakdown will be reaches to the liver de novo synthesis of fatty acid that de novo means a new synthesis in the body it is not the fatty acid we are talking about from the diet it is new fatty acid synthesis in the body so this uh, insulin regulate by acting on the regulatory enzyme which is acetyl coa carboxylase acetyl coa carboxylase is the first enzyme which converts acetyl coa to melanoyl coa insulin dephosphorylates this enzyme and thus activates this enzyme and increases the fatty acid synthesis in well fed state that means excess amount of carbohydrate can be converted to fat lipogenesis lipogenesis whenever we talk about lipogenesis we talk about the synthesis of triacyl glycerol this tri insulin does not have a direct effect on uh, any enzyme of triacyl glycerol synthesis but it increases lipogenesis by increasing the availability of substrates such as fatty acid and glycerol 3 phosphate insulin also increases cholesterol synthesis by acting on the regulatory enzyme of cholesterol metabolism that is hng coa reductase insulin dephosphorylates this enzyme and thus activates this enzyme and increases the cholesterol synthesis in well fed state on the, on the contrary insulin also has effect inhibiting effect on lipolysis that means when we are in well fed state when lipogenesis is happening we should not have lipolysis lipolysis is a breakdown of triacyl glycerol which takes place in adipose tissue so insulin causes the activation of lipase phosphatase which will deactivate the regulatory enzyme of lipolysis that is hormone sensitive lipase thus it decreases lipolysis in well fed state beta oxidation of fatty acid insulin indirectly stops beta oxidation of fatty acid on one side when we are synthesizing the fatty acid by de novo synthesis of fatty acid we don't want this fatty acid to be degraded this will be protected by the first product of fatty acid synthesis pathway that is melanoyl coa melanoyl coa inhibits the gateway of mitochondria that is carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 and thus not allow any fatty acid to go inside the mitochondria and undergo beta oxidation we will be talking about this little later in the subsequent slides if we see the individual four tissues what happens what insulin does in all these individual tissues we will see these four tissues will be liver adipose tissue skeletal muscles and brain and we will see how in presence of insulin the lipid metabolism is affected in all these four tissues when we talk about liver insulin increases the fatty acid synthesis by de novo synthesis of fatty acid insulin also increases triacyl glycerol synthesis which we call lipogenesis by providing the substrate such as fatty acid and glycerol 3 phosphate for the synthesis of triacyl glycerol when we talk about adipose tissue we just discuss the lipoprotein lipase insulin induces or increases the activity of lipoprotein lipase thus it provides the fatty acid to adipose tissue 
and this fatty acid can be utilized by adipose tissue to form triacylglycerol and it is stored in the lipid droplets in adipose tissue. When we talk about skeletal muscle in well-fed state, the fat is a secondary fuel for skeletal muscle in the well-fed state. They primarily depend on glucose in well-fed state for energy purpose. Brain, brain does not require, does not synthesize triacylglycerol. It has no glycogen stores and it is completely dependent on the availability of glucose in well-fed state. Now when we know about the insulin effect of well-fed state, let us see the opposite hormone. Insulin is an anabolic hormone. Insulin is a hypoglycemic hormone that is decreasing the blood glucose level. But when insulin is not there, someone has to increase the blood glucose level or to the contrary so that the energy will be provided to the different tissues. This is done by glucagon. Glucagon is released by alpha cells of pancreas and it has the opposite effects of uh, on lipid metabolism compared to insulin. So in, insulin increases lipogenesis but decreases lipolysis but glucagon increases lipolysis. How it does so? Glucagon basically acts on the regulatory enzyme, the hormone sensitive lipase. It phosphorylates this enzyme and activates this enzyme and activation of hormone sensitive lipase will give you tremendous amount of fatty acid and glycerol. So this, fat, this uh, fatty acid can be utilized for energy purpose by beta oxidation. Thus, it increases beta oxidation of fatty acid as well. And this beta oxidation of fatty acid gives you tremendous amount of energy. One molecule of palmitate can give 129 ATPs. So, so many amount of fatty acid can help in taking care of our energy during the starvation or diabetes when there is no insulin. Excess amount of fatty acid which is released from lipolysis which will be taken up by albumin in the plasma and will be uh, transferred to the liver. Liver, it has two fate. Either it can undergo beta oxidation of fatty acid to give you tremendous amount of energy or these fatty acid can undergo uh, the lipogenesis that means synthesis of triacylglycerol. So either, either way it can be done. This, this uh, acetyl-CoA which is produced by beta oxidation of fatty acid will be so much which cannot be handled by TCA cycle and this will go in the formation of ketogenesis. So in starvation, we are not talking about in diabetes, in starvation this ketone bodies can be utilized by the brain because there is no other energy source. But in diabetes, we are eating well but insulin is not there. So ketone bodies utilization will not come into picture in the beginning phase of diabetes. So glucagon inhibits cholesterol synthesis also as insulin activates the enzyme HNG-CoA reductase of cholesterol metabolism. But Glucagon on the contrary deactivates this enzyme by phosphorylating it. So phosphorylating form of HNG-CoA reductase is inactive. Thus glucagon inactivates the cholesterol metabolism. It also decreases the de novo synthesis of fatty acid. De novo synthesis of fatty acids takes place when we are in well-fed state in presence of insulin. When we have excess amount of glucose which can be utilized to form fatty acid and which can later form triacylglycerol. But in starvation or in conditions when the glucose is not properly utilized, when we talk about diabetes mellitus, we don't have the de novo synthesis of insulin because insulin, this de novo synthesis of insulin, uh, the de novo synthesis of fatty acid will be inhibited by glucagon by phosphorylating the enzyme. Now, similarly, if we see the individual tissue level, what happens when glucagon is there and insulin is not there? So increase amount of fatty acid oxidation that is beta oxidation of fatty acid in liver to give you tremendous amount of energy. It also causes the synthesis of ketone bodies. So ketogenesis increases in liver. When we see uh, adipose tissue, so lipolysis will increases that is fat degradation and this fat degradation will give you so much amount of fatty acid. So increase amount of fatty acid release from adipose tissue which will be taken up by albumin and delivered to the liver for fatty acid oxidation. When we see resting skeletal muscle, they use, utilize fatty acid from adipose tissue and ketone bodies from liver for the energy purpose during the conditions when insulin is not there. When we say about brain, initial days of fasting, it uses glucose as a fuel but later stages of fasting, it can use ketone bodies as a fuel. So this is applicable only in the case of starvation because the person does not have enough food 
or there is from prolonged starvation when person is not eating well. But in diabetes, this is not applicable because person is eating well, but insulin is not able to utilize that glucose which is available in the plasma. Thus, uh, ketone body's utilization by the brain in diabetes, in the initial phase of diabetes, is, does not exist. When there is so much amount of diabetic ketoacidosis, some amount of uh, uh, ketone bodies can be utilized, but when carbohydrate or glucose is not available. But if person is eating well, glucose is always the preferred choice for brain, for fuel. Now let us see lipid metabolism in well-fed state. We have already discussed what insulin does in well-fed state. Now let us see lipid metabolism in well-fed state. So in well-fed state, if we see, if we have adipose tissue, if we imagine this as adipose tissue, so insulin, what insulin does, it causes increased uptake of glucose inside this adipose tissue. So they are receptors which are insulin sensitive. GLUT4 receptor which is present in adipose tissue and skeletal muscle is insulin sensitive. So in presence of insulin, these will be activated. They, they will be coming to the membrane surface and they will allow more amount of glucose entry to the adipose tissue. This is one way of doing it. Second, when we talk about specifically lipid, we have something called as chylomicron. Chylomicron brings the dietary lipid that is uh, which is formed in the intestinal mucosal cell. This dietary lipid, this chylomicron will be packed with triacylglycerol, cholesterol ester, vitamins. So this is triacylglycerol rich and when it passes through the capillary bed near to adipose tissue, their lipoprotein lipase act on this and it will break down triacylglycerol into fatty acid and glycerol. This fatty acid can be taken up by adipose tissue and this fatty acid will combine with glycerol 3-phosphate in adipose tissue and it can form triacylglycerol and can be stored in adipose tissue. So this is one way at the adipose tissue. What happened at the liver level? As we just discussed, insulin increases the fatty acid synthesis, increase amount of carbohydrate in well-fed state can increase the fatty acid synthesis in liver. When there is an increased amount of fatty acid synthesis in the liver, this fatty acid combined with glycerol and from triacylglycerol in the liver. This triacylglycerol which is formed in the liver will be packed in VLDL. VLDL is very low density lipoprotein. What is the role of VLDL? VLDL transports the endogenous lipid from liver to extrahepatic tissue. So this triacylglycerol which is formed in the liver will be packed in this VLDL and will be transported uh, to the extrahepatic tissue. Again, when this VLDL, which is triacylglycerol rich, comes to these blood capillaries, which is near adipose tissue, in the peripheral, peripheral tissues, this will be again acted upon by lipoprotein lipase. And this lipoprotein lipase again gives the fatty acid and glycerol and leaves the VLDL remnant or IDL, which will be taken up by liver later. So in normal situation, in well-fed state, insulin increases the triacylglycerol synthesis, insulin increases the fatty acid synthesis, insulin uh, increases the glucose distribution in the tissues. But what happens when there is no insulin? When we talk about diabetes. So lipid metabolism in diabetes, either we are talking about less insulin compared to the previous one, or we are talking about no insulin at all. In both these conditions, the enzymes which are responsible for uh, maintaining that pathway in presence of insulin will be affected. And here we are going to discuss about some of the lipid metabolic pathway which are affected in absence of insulin in diabetes mellitus. So we see that glucose uptake by the insulin sensitive uh, GLUT, uh, GLUT receptors will not be there. So there is no glucose uptake by these tissues will take place. Now if glucose uptake is not uh, taking place in the tissues which are insulin dependent then what happens? These tissues will be deprived of energy. Then what they do? They will utilize the available stores. So if we talk about available stores of adipose tissue, it has triacylglycerol as the available store. 
in form of lipid. So this uh, available resource in the form of triacylglycerol will be broken down to get energy, which is called as lipolysis. So this uh, lipolysis will give us fatty acid, which can go to the liver and undergo beta oxidation. So in this particular slide, we'll see that how fatty acid synthesis, which takes place in presence of insulin, and the beta oxidation of fatty acid, which takes place in absence of insulin, are regulated. So normally, acetyl-CoA forms melanyl-CoA in the presence of acetyl-CoA carboxylase. This is the regulatory enzyme of fatty acid synthesis. So insulin, by dephosphorylating this particular enzyme, activates this enzyme and it leads to the formation of fatty acid. And that is the no synthesis of fatty acid in presence of insulin or we can say in well-fed state. This fatty acid can be activated by fatty acyl-CoA. Uh, this fatty acid can be activated to fatty acyl-CoA by thiokinase. And this fatty uh, fat activated fatty acid will try to go to the mitochondria for the beta oxidation. But melanyl-CoA inhibits CPT1, that is carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, which is a gatekeeper of this mitochondria. So when melanyl-CoA inhibits carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, it will not allow this fatty acyl-CoA to go into the mitochondria. Thus, it prevents the beta oxidation happening when, B, when de novo synthesis of fatty acid takes place. So this is in well-fed state in presence of insulin. But what happens when insulin is not there? When insulin is not there, in diabetes mellitus, when insulin is absent or insulin is not working and there is so much amount of uh, lipolysis taking place in adipose tissue, there is increased amount of fatty acid which is coming to the liver. This increased amount of fatty acid, which is acyl-CoA, can inhibit acetyl-CoA carboxylase. This acetyl-CoA carboxylase, this effect of uh, free fatty acid inhibiting acetyl-CoA carboxylase will be enforced by presence of glucagon in absence of insulin. Thus, when acetyl-CoA cannot be converted to melanyl-CoA, the inhibition of melanyl-CoA to CPT1 will be lifted. When melanyl-CoA levels goes down in absence of acetyl-CoA carboxylase, the inhibition which melanyl-CoA does on carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 will not be there. And thus, this activated fatty acid can easily go to the mitochondria and can undergo beta oxidation of fatty acid and gives you acetyl CoA. That means, in absence of insulin, when in absence of insulin, glucagon is released, causing so much amount of lipolysis, more amount of fatty acid movement to the liver, and this causes fatty acid oxidation in liver and production of acetyl CoA in the liver. So, the net effect in diabetes mellitus is decreased amount of fatty acid synthesis increase amount of beta oxidation and increase amount of acetyl CoA. In this slide, it is in schematic way, it's uh, in the flowchart way, it has shown that how when diabetes insulin glucagon ratio decreases an increased amount of glucagon can cause the phosphorylation of acetyl CoA carboxylase, thus inactivation of acetyl CoA carboxylase, decreasing the melanyl CoA level, which inhibits or decreases the de novo synthesis of fatty acid which will lift the inhibition by CPT1 and which increases the beta oxidation of fatty acid in diabetes mellitus. So in this particular slide, you can see that when normally, when increased amount of lipolysis takes place, more amount of fatty acid movement to the liver takes place and it will undergo beta oxidation. And as we have seen in the last slide, more amount of acetyl-CoA will be formed. This acetyl-CoA in the beginning phase will enter into TCA cycle to give us energy. but when this lipolysis is ramp rampant and so much amount of fatty acid is coming to the liver, that means in we are talking about diabetes mellitus, more amount of fatty acid, more lipolysis, more fatty acid, and more fatty acid transferred to the liver, and thus more beta oxidation. That means more beta oxidation gives more amount of acetyl CoA also, but more amount of beta oxidation can also give us more amount of NADH. Thus, increased amount of beta oxidation increases the NADH to NAD plus ratio. This shifts the momentum from ox oxaloacetate to malate, thus makes the oxaloacetate acetate unavailable to combine with acetyl-CoA and give you citrate. So because of this, TCA cycle will be decreased and this acetyl-CoA which is 
produced by beta oxidation of fatty acid, this acetyl-CoA moves toward the another pathway which is called as ketogenesis. That means in absence of insulin, there will be ketone bodies will be synthesized. The acute complication of type 1 diabetes is diabetic ketoacidosis. Increased amount of ketone bodies in the blood initially will be buffered by the buffers, different buffer system we have. But when there is so much amount of ketone bodies produced, the buffer will not able to handle this ketone bodies. And as we know, ketone bodies such as beta hydroxybutyric acidic acid and acet acetoacetic acid and beta hydroxybutyrate both are acidic in nature. So in these cases, what happens? This will decrease the blood pH level and it causes acidosis. And the acidosis in presence of ketone bodies is called as diabetic ketoacidosis. If we see the cholesterol metabolism, again, insulin, because of decreased amount of insulin and increased amount of glucagon, the enzyme responsible for regulating the cholesterol metabolism, such as HNG-CoA reductase, will be deactivated by glucagon presence and thus increase amount of cholesterol synthesis. Now, if we see the TAG synthesis in liver, when liver synthesizes TAG from fatty acid available from adipose tissue, as we just discussed, so much amount of lipolysis will take place at the adipose tissue level in absence of insulin. This excess amount of fatty acid will reach to liver. Now this fatty acid can have two fate. Either this fatty acid can undergo beta oxidation to give energy or this fatty acid can combine with the precursor, again one more precursor for TAG synthesis that is glycerol 3-phosphate and can form triacyl cholesterol in liver. That means lipolysis is taking place at the adipose tissue but lipogenesis is taking place at the liver. Here lipogenesis is not regulated by insulin, it is just depend upon the availability of the substrate. So availability of fatty acid and availability of glycerol 3-phosphate will lead to synthesis of triacylglycerol. So this triacylglycerol synthesis uh, which takes place in the liver, there will be so much amount of triacylglycerol which will be synthesized because of increased amount of fatty acid load which is coming from adipose tissue in absence of uh, insulin. More amount of this, this triacylglycerol is packed, packed in the VLDL. VLDL is responsible for transferring this endogenous lipid to extrahepatic tissue. But here we have one issue. Here lipoprotein lipase which is responsible for breaking down the triacylglycerol in fatty acid and uh, glycerol is not present. In absence of insulin, lipoprotein lipase is absent. It is not induced. So this VLDL will not able to break this, uh, this uh, lipoprotein lipase will not able to break triacylglycerol which is present in VLDL. Thus there is so much amount of VLDL will increase in the blood and VLDL same is applicable to chylomicron also because chylomicron again will be broken down by lipoprotein lipase. The TAG triacylglycerol in chylomicron will be broken, up, broken, broken down by lipoprotein lipase and this will give you glycerol and fatty acid. But in absence of insulin, when lipoprotein lipase is not there, here even chylomicron as well as VLDL will not be broken down. The TAG in VLDL and chylomicron will not be broken down. An increased amount of TAG rich VLDL and chylomicron will be present in plasma. That's why there is hypertriacylglycerolemia which is observed in diabetes mellitus. Now, when this VLDL, which is triacylglycerol rich, is present in plasma, so much amount of VLDL, which is triacylglycerol rich, is present in plasma, it exchanges this during its metabolism, it exchanges this triacylglycerol with cholesterol ester, which is present in HDL. HDL is responsible for reverse cholesterol transport. HDL takes up the cholesterol from the tissues and convert it to cholesterol ester by the action of lysine cholesterol acyl transferase LCAT and this cholesterol ester will be stored in the core of HDL. During the metabolism, it exchanges this cholesterol ester with VLDL, LDL and IDL and takes up some amount of triacylglycerol. So when VLDL, IDL and LDL which is, for, which is uh, now VLDL which is triacylglycerol rich, exchange cholesterol ester with HDL. Now HDL molecule will be more, it will be uh, triacylglycerol rich. 
This triacylglycerol rich HDL molecule when it reaches to the liver it will be acted upon by hepatic lipase and it will be uh, this color, uh, TAG will be broken down. Thus it results into decreased amount of HDL levels in diabetes mellitus. When VLDL increases during the exchange it forms IDL and LDL the small density small smaller dense LDL particle which is increased in diabetes mellitus is due to more amount of VLDL formation triacylglycerol uh, rich VLDL formation which takes place in diabetes mellitus. So the first thing which occur here is because of absence of insulin lipoprotein lipase is not activated and when absence of lipoprotein lipase this triacylglycerol which is present in VLDL will not be broken down and increased amount of triacylglycerol rich VLDL in the plasma lead to the formation of smaller dense LDL particle and due to the exchange of triacylglycerol uh, against cholesterol ester with HDL it leads to decreased amount of HDL level in the plasma. So that is the observation lipid profile observation when we see in diabetes mellitus we find that triacylglycerol is high in the plasma and HDL cholesterol will be low in the plasma and smaller dense, dense particle of LDL and H smaller HDL will be higher in the plasma. So this smaller uh, HDL compared to the normal uh, discoidal uh, HDL part spherical HDL particle small molecule of HDL is less anti atherogenic compared to the normal HDL which is a atherogenic particle and this small dense LDL particle is more atherogenic uh, so that leads to increased risk of atherosclerosis and coronary artery diseases. So this exchange between uh, VLDL the triacylglycerol present in VLDL and the cholesterol ester present in HDL takes place by the action of enzyme cholesterol, cholesterol, uh, cholesterol ester transfer protein which helps in the transfer of exchange of this triacylglycerol and cholesterol ester between these lipoproteins. So increased accumulation increased exchange lead to increased accumulation of TAG rich VLDL result in increased IDL increased LDL and decreased amount of HDL in plasma. So summary we will see that increased amount of lipolysis in adipose tissue that means more amount of fatty acid mobilization. Increased lipogenesis in the liver high TAG high triacylglycerol which will be, which will be packed in VLDL which will lead to increased uh, triacylglycerol or hypertriacylglycerolemia in diabetes which will lead to high LDL and low HDL in diabetes mellitus. Increase beta oxidation of fatty acid which will give you energy as well as acetyl CoA and this acetyl CoA can give you ketone bodies that means increased amount of ketone bodies in diabetes mellitus lead to ketoacidosis. So what is the take home message today that absence of insulin leads to dysregulation of lipid metabolism in diabetes mellitus and which results in high triacylglycerol that leads to hypertriacylglycerolemia high LDL cholesterol that is smaller denser HD, uh, LDL particle low HDL cholesterol that means the, the HDL cholesterol which is important as a uh, and, uh, is, which is important anti atherogenic so the level of HDL will be decreased and this lipid dysregulation is a major factor which causes atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. So how should we uh, com, uh, how should we use the measures to uh, maintain our lipid profile level so the lifestyle modification basically eat healthy be physically fit and avoid excessive weight gain can have a positive influence when a person is diabetic by increasing the exercise the more amount of glucose can be entered inside can enter inside the tissue even in absence of insulin. So having a positive uh, or healthy lifestyle can have a better influence when the person is diabetic. So that is the take home message from today's slide. Thank you.